Joan Quinn Profiles. As an editor for Andy Warhol's interview with the Los Angeles Herald Examiner, LA Style, and Detour Magazines, Joan covered the social set, the Hollywood hotshots, the international art scene, the mysteries of food, the excitement of travel, and the fabulous world of fashion. Joan continues to find creative people on the cutting edge who make things happen. Here's Joan Agajanian Quinn. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome to the Joan Quinn Profiles. Waiting to be profiled are composer Charles Fox and actor-director Tim McNeil. Author, composer, conductor Charles Fox was born and raised in New York. He was taking piano lessons when he was nine years old, started his first band at 15, and at 18, after high school graduation, he worked at the Fairmont Hotel in New Jersey with a Latin quartet. He's really big on Latin music. <laughs> <laughs> um, that winter, Charles was on a flight to Paris uh, and composing uh, letters, which we're going to find out about. But he was also learning and studying composition. He uh, wound up with Madame Boulanger. Actually, Mademoiselle Boulanger. Oh, that's right, yeah. Mademoiselle. Right, and I'll right, tell you right. the reason why. Because uh, <laughs> <I forgot. laughs> a, a, a woman of a certain age is entitled to be called Madame even if she's not married. But to her, uh, her mother was Madame Boulanger, so she was Mademoiselle. And I forgot, she was yeah. Mademoiselle forever. forever. Did she ever marry? She never married, but she died in 93. I know, she was great. If you hadn't gotten on that flight, because it was serendipity that happened in, after your gra high school graduate. If you hadn't gotten on your flight, what would your life have been, do you think? That is so hard to know, isn't it? <laughs> it is. But you know, there you were, 18 years old. Um, I, was, I was working the band, and I was about, I was about seven to eight, 18 years old, and uh, coming home late at night one night from a, from a job, living with my parents in, in the Bronx. And uh, coincidentally and uh, uh, fortunately, uh, I met the woman who was my piano teacher who lived in the building on the fifth floor. Oh. And she was at 2, 3 o'clock in the morning walking a dog. So it was rather serendipitous, it really was. And sh uh, she said, so what are you doing with your life? And I said, well, I'm playing in bands. And I had studied composition in high school, and I had written some compositions, had written some songs, a lot of songs in Spanish, by the way, because I, I liked Spanish music. How did you know that so well? Because you really loved the Latin music did, yeah. and, the, and the language. I never spoke the language. But you wrote so I, that they could sing like I had, that. Well, I had a good <laughs> feel for it, and I got into playing for the really the, the great Latin bands. I, mean, I know. Ray Barreto and Tito Puente. And the, I know. That but, was so uh, great, reading about uh, that. And I was really accepted by them as, as someone who... Uh, it wasn't a matter of speaking Spanish, you know, I, I had the flavor. Of you the had the flavor, of, yeah. yeah. The music. Do they well, speak Spanish to you? No. They just, no, they just knew bad. you were a musician there. Yeah. I know, that was the, I love that part of the book. Okay, go on. So, so, I, was, <laughs> so I met with my, my piano teacher, she said, what are you doing with your life? And she said, well, why don't you go to Juilliard or someplace like that and, and continue your education? And I said, I, I really did not want to be in a formal education system. She said, you know, there's a fantastic teacher, a woman in France named Nadia Boulanger. Oh, she and knew she, and She's Mama's the head of a, a conservatory for the summer in Fontainebleau, in the Palace of Fontainebleau, France. And uh, I'll bet uh, if, you, if you could get there, that would make a big difference in your life. Oh. So my parents, um, my father's a window cleaner. You know, he didn't, he didn't dream of sending his kids to, to Paris, uh, education, all that. But my, uh, my teacher said, let me speak to your parents. I think they'll understand. And so they made it happen for me to go for the summer. But that's like a mentor. I mean, that's like a teacher who really cares about her oh student, God, isn't yeah, it? Yeah. I mean, she, we, we, I was very close to her. And Mademoiselle Boulanger felt the same way about you. She was well, very... Well, I have to tell you, from the t first day I met her, from the first lesson, sitting so next to her at the piano bench, uh, I knew my life was going to be about composing music. It's so I mean, amazing. She, she, was, she kind of emanated this... This joyousness about music, this this extraordinary experience that is a music composition. But she looked stern from her pictures. Was she stern? She was a lot of fun. Yeah, she, she could be. She could be stern. First of all, she could be. She could give yeah. me an elbow on the rib and knock me off the piano bench. Right. She could say silly little things. 
She could do imitations of, her, of me or her other composers that looked like you. Oh, so she was know, fun, yeah. too. She was, she was fun. You know, as I was reading the book, which is Killing Me Softly, which is your, the biggest song ever written, probably, um, My Life in Music by Charles Fox, I loved the letters. The letters were all in italics, and there were so many. How did you write? You were writing to your parents every day. I, practically. You know, I lived alone. I was there. So I, I went there for the summer, and Mademoiselle Boulanger asked me to stay on and study with her in Paris. She said, don't worry about money. I know you have very little money. You never have to pay me for a lesson. So um, I, I, I treated that experience as though it was something that I knew how important it was in my life. I wrote home very often because my parents, I, I couldn't make a phone call. I had no phone. And my parents were anxious to know what happened to their son in, in Paris and what was I doing. And I, I, didn't, I didn't write letters like send money because there was very little to send. <laughs> but I wrote how appreciative I was of everything they did send, you know. But I wrote about my teacher and I wrote about my life in Paris. You wrote about the compositions, about the people around you. They were so in interesting. Paris. Life in, in, in Paris. The, this was 1959, 1960. I turned 19 in the, in the fall there, and I didn't speak a word of French. Uh, you know, I had very little money. So, so it, was, it was about Paris. It was all about music. Of course, after a while, I had many friends and all that. And, uh, yeah, but it was so sweet. You were such a loving son, loved Charles, and you yeah, would write yeah. about how she taught you this harmony or that composition yeah. or how to conduct. I mean, you right. actually wrote theory to them, I did. like you know, they would understand. My father and mother could have no understanding, <laughs> but they loved the experience of, of getting my letters, as I loved the experience of getting their letters, you know. Yeah. Um, when the letter gets slipped in under my door in this room that I rented in, in the woman's apartment, I mean, uh, a letter from home was, was gold, you know. But the thing is, <clears throat> usually people don't keep all those letters. Well, that's the amazing <laughs> thing, and, and I didn't know my mother kept them. Um, my mother lived here for the last 10 years of her life in California. Yes. We, kept, we kept the apartment in the Bronx going. It was just easier. And about two or three years before she passed away, we decided we would bring her important mementos back to her. So my wife, Joan and I, were looking through the apartment. And in the dresser, in the bedroom, tucked under some stuff, sheets or something, there was a shoebox. And the, my mother had preserved all the letters that I'd written. So she just had them lined up like this she in the shoebox? Yeah, she, and they, they were all sorted out and everything. Um, so there were about 200 sweet. letters, and the, letter, so and the letters sweet. went on and on about my life. So that was the catalyst for this book. Um, when we brought those letters home, my daughter, uh, Xerox them so she could, we, it, my, my mm. other th my two kids could read them, my three children. And have them. And then I had my, my, computer, my assistant put it in the computer so they could read them because, you know, the old airmail uh, par avion or stationary bleed through on both sides. Oh, exactly. Um, it was real thin. Real thin, like <laughs> tissue paper, right. So now they could read it. And my son, who's a writer, my son Robbie, uh, mentioned to his agent about these letters. And the agent said, gee, that sounds like something his father, who's a literary agent, would like to say. Oh, from one agent to right. another agent. So the next thing I know, I get a call from Bob Rosen uh, of the RLR agency, his agency. And he said, I heard about these letters. Could I read them? And I thought, well, it's kind of personal. I mean, these are my letters. You know? <laughs> At one, one point, I admonished, in one letter, I, I admonished my parents not to show them to anyone else because people were sending me letters. Oh, I read your letters, which wasn't intended for the ears. So I said, you know, you're asking me to send. And he said, well, I, you know, it's 40 years ago, first of all. And he said, I just think it's such an interesting story about a young man alone in Paris studying this extraordinary teacher. You know, Nadia Boulanger was uh, Aaron Copeland's teacher 40 years before me. She had the best people <clears throat> there, didn't she? She was, a, yeah, she did. I could go on and name composer after composer, you know. Uh, but I'll tell you this, her teacher was Ferré. Oh, Gabrielle Ferré. Ferré? Ferré was her teacher. Her friend at the conservatory was Ravel. And her best friend in music was Stravinsky. Well, was she a composer herself or she could she just was. teach? She was. She was a composer, but her sister, Lily Boulanger was a, already a famed composer, um, but the, passed away at the age of 25. Oh and my supposedly, God. Nadia, who was the younger sister, uh, when her sister died, said to her on her deathbed, Continue my footsteps, but teach. Oh. And she took that as oh. a lifelong ambition. Oh, that was yeah. it to teach. To, to, that was her. Right. And you can find records by Nadia Boulanger, by, by, uh, by Lily Boulanger, but um, she, it was in teaching that she made her mark. You talk about <laughs> all the people who. They were her friends. Did she study with them? Did she study with... Um, she studied with Ferré. She studied with Ferré. Yeah, at the and then who came to study with her? 
Oh, so many people. Uh, I mean, I'll tell you the names you know, Quincy Jones and Michelle Legrand. That's what I was going to ask you. How many of the people who studied with her ended up in the professional world? So think, those I two. Think, I think many. Uh, uh, Glass. Uh, did did, you, did he, he Philip Glass? Philip Glass studied with her. Oh, but also uh, well, Schumann, Piston. Uh, oh, is uh, that uh, right? Generations of uh, I see. Uh, uh, even Yehudi Menuhin studied with her. Prince Rainier of Monaco was her godson. Is that right? She yes. she seemed like such a great woman. She was. What a, a wonderful person for you to know. Well, <laughs> I, as I, I, as the book says, to this day, I, I I carry her, her with me. Really, you know, not a day goes by that I don't think about Nadia Boulanger, and everything she gave me because it was really, she gave me a whole life of music. You know, how do you how do you? The not technique in the book where you write in italics yeah. and then you have your own voice right. in, in uh, regular print right. is great. I love well, that. You. you wrote music, well, you're talking about all this classical music, but you wrote music for TV shows, Mark Goodson's show. Right. Things. Well, of course, what, what, what also, I, I mean, I have a lot of parts to my musical career. I know. And it continues, but of course, I've done a lot of television work. Yes. Starting with Wide World of Sports, the theme for the Wide World of Sports, and Monday Night Football. Uh, and then when I came to California, I did the movie Barbarella uh, in New York, and then that led to my getting Goodbye Columbus, which was the film that brought me to California. Oh, that brought you here. You worked, you were involved with the Newman family, um, Lionel, Randy. Well, I mean, uh, Lionel Newman was head of 20th Century Fox. Is that you was, were working there? And he was a kind of a champion of mine. And his brother, Mark Newman, was my agent. So that was pretty yeah. close. And, and, and <laughs> one of his sons, David Newman, is a good friend of ours. I guess so. There yeah. you are. What about uh, Broadway shows? Well, um, I've had a few shows. Um, I haven't yet gotten to Broadway. <laughs> but um, Norman Gimble and I have a couple of shows that we produced. One based on Midsummer Night's Dream, the musical. It was done at the John Anson Ford Theater here. Also. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, with Cleavon Little playing the king. Right, I remember and, that. And uh, we also had a musical called The Eleventh that uh, Shelley uh, Berman uh, did. Uh, we actually did a production of Flor in Florida. And I'm uh, about to start work with Hal David on a, on a new musical based on a film. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Hal David is fabulous. He's fabulous. We love him, yeah. We yeah. live in his brother's house. Do you? Yes. Yeah, Mac Max? Max House oh, really? on Elta. Yeah. Oh, yeah, of course I knew Max, yeah. Did you ever come there? So many people said, we were in your living room. We were with Mac when you we know, were I, doing yeah, I, like, I, I knew Mac when, when he was living in, in uh, Palm Springs. Palm Springs. He yeah. left. He sold the house to us yeah. and moved to Palm Springs. Uh, so many things to talk about. Just tell us your biggest Killing Me Softly because our time is running out. Well, Killing Me Softly was uh, Norman Gimbel and I wrote for a young artist named Laura Lieberman. And um, we had nine songs finished on the first album, and we needed a tenth. And Norman came up with an idea for a song called Killing Me Softly with his blues. And Killing Me Softly sounded really interesting as, a, as an expression. With his blues sounded old-fashioned, even in 1970. So he thought for a moment and said, how about Killing Me Softly with a song? Let's write a song about what a song does, because uh, around the world, songs move people, they internalize things. And, and you hear something, a line in the story makes you feel like it's your own life. So that, that was the story. The, the, the good thing that happened with that was that the Laurie Liebman's record made some noise but didn't, didn't become a hit record. But the album was, was promoted on uh, American Airlines. And oh, yes, I read know, that. I read everything. The book know, is so good. great. I love the book. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm repeating what you already read. <laughs> um, but the curious thing that happened is uh, w one day uh, Roberta Flack was flying from Los Angeles to New York, and she heard this record. And she started writing the notes and the words. And then when she got to Los An to New York, she, she called Quincy Jones. Uh. And she said, how do I meet Charles Fox? So the next thing I had to call from someone handed me a telephone at Paramount, Paramount Pictures and said, hi, this is Roberta Flack, and I'm going to sing your songs. Oh, and she made it. So talk about serendipity. How about if she had flown on United Airlines? Exactly. That day? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and really, I keep saying we've got so much to talk about. Your papers, the papers on that song are going to the Smithsonian? Uh, no, actually, Happy Days. Oh, yeah. Happy, oh. Happy Days, uh, uh, Smithsonian. With the Fonz. With the Fonz, yeah. This, uh, well, it's not my papers. I, I, if you watch the beginning of Happy Days, uh -huh. one record comes down to 45 and it drops yeah, on two yeah. That was one singular record that was made for the show. And if you could stop the, the, the tape, you'd see it says, um, Happy Days, music by Charles Fox, lyrics by Norm McGill. It was one of a kind. So when the, when the Smithsonian said that they're having a new music, American music wing and asked if I had anything oh. singular object, I thought about it and said, well, I have this thing in the back that's been produced and gave it to me as a gift. 
just the, in a frame. And I pulled it out, and I thought, oh my God, this is, this is a fa fabulous. That's so great. So that's going to sit now uh, next to the Fonz's jacket. Did you take and it, or Smithsonian. will Henry go back with uh, you, Winkler? I don't know. It's called uh, an induction. An induction, yes, yeah. An induction. I, I don't know about it. You'll have to come back and tell you. That'll be great. <laughs> oh, our time is up. But, oh, it's been, but you have to read the book, because the book is incredible. Thank you, Charles. Oh, my pleasure, John. It's nice to be you. with you. Don't go away. We'll be right back with director Tim McNeil. <laughs> Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and we're back with the Joan Quinn Profiles. I'm here with actor-director Tim McNeil. He was raised in Houston, and he studied acting at the Stella Adler School in Hollywood. You've seen him on TV, in films, and on the stage. And he's written over 20 plays, which have been produced in Los Angeles. And I think we should start with the Stella Adler, because that mm -hmm. was pretty interesting. Um, that you've used those actors in some of your plays? Yeah, we, I, it's sort of like a mafia, Stella. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I wondered, yeah, is yeah. it? So we try and use, uh, uh, plus we have the same language, I try and use those guys oh. and girls, and, uh, and we're just, um, we're just, it's like a big family. So what what, what uh, method does she teach? How, you took acting there, mm -hmm. right? So I studied. I studied for two and a half years with Miss Adler, and in fact, I got to drive her. Wasn't she great? Was, oh, it was an amazing experience, and um, she taught me so much. I would pick her up, and she'd be studying, and she was 85 years old at that time, so, um, so I have lots of stories about Stella, but um, the, the method that she uses isn't really a method at all to me because it's about the imagination, which is really the source of creativity. It's a standard uh, acting technique, Stanislavski-based, except for the use of the imagination, which we teach, which is a little different from Strasberg, which is a, a completely viable technique, or Meisner. So. Oh, that's what I wondered. What are those differences, then? Hers is more imagination? Yeah, we only use the imagination. And in what way? How, what would you do? For instance, if you're creating a character, um, Stella believed, and we, we believe that at the school, is that that person is separate from you, and their experiences are different. Ah. And some of the, some of the um, characters that I've played, there's no way I could have any personal experience that would connect me to those things in a really specific way. Imaginative just, in that way. Yeah. Imagine you're someone else. So we use our imagination to create specific memories for our characters. Ah, uh, so how would you do that? Like if you had to play um, who? A policeman. Yeah, so if I'm playing a policeman who for some reason is, has had to shoot someone, for, for instance, I could create that specific memory in my imagination and any backstory that I needed for the character. So you would research that backstory, mm -hmm. and then you would become that person. Right. As opposed to trying to find a personal experience that matches up. Oh, I see, I see. Which doesn't really do that. So if you... Or at least we believe that. But Strasberg has trained many great actors, so... So let's, so let's get into that a theater collective. What is it? There's a lot of big-name actors in it. There are, and uh, I think Stella's has always, Jack Rogers, who is the head of the school, he's always wanted a theater company there that could really bring together the Stella Adler family and do theater there. And so that's what's finally happened, I think. Um, we did a play, The Charm of Making, which I wrote uh, last year. And we're thinking about doing, uh, there's a couple of other productions that they're wanting to do for the following year. But it's really a coming together of the Stella Adler family. Is it a new thing? Is it a new Relatively idea? Relatively new. It's about so the collective is, because I haven't ever seen that before. When I was reading your bio, that's mm -hmm. what came, really jumped out, because I've been to the Stella Adler Theater. Those little theaters are great. Yeah, was there two great. or three up there? There's three up there, uh -huh. yeah. And uh, we, it's, it's an old idea. When I was at school, we did have a company, and then the company sort of had a, went through a, uh, the, the school went through a trying period, and uh, the company broke up. And ever since then, Jack Rogers has wanted another company back So then. that's why it's called The Collective? 
Yeah. Oh, I see. So, so there was a whole list of, of names. Mm -hmm. Name some of them, including your name. Yeah, and uh, Mark Ruffalo, right. uh, Christopher Thornton, um, Holland Taylor. Uh, a lot of really wonderful actors are involved. Do you read together? Do you act together? Uh, we do when we can. Uh, Ruffalo and I have done probably about 20 plays together. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, not Nothing recently because he's busy he's being a movie star. Really good, too. <laughs> he's fantastic. <laughs> he's really good. He? Yeah. He's such and, a good actor. And he's a sweet person. He so. seems like it, yeah. yeah. He's a very nice person, so. So, um, so, you, so you would do, like, one of those actors would read your play or at a reading or something mm -hmm. like that. Do, do they do anything else? Like in the old theater companies, everyone, people did the lights and the costumes and you're well, too we far have, advanced. Yeah, I mean, some of them don't. Well, we can't ask Holland or Mark to do the lights. Or, but, you know, I, but it might be interesting. Yeah, absolutely. You know, Mark directed one of my f first full-length plays. It was called Margaret, which we did at the Hudson Theater. And I remember the night before we opened, he was at two o'clock in the morning. He was up on a ladder hanging lights. Yeah, well, that's just the kind of guy he of, is. It's also part of if you want something to be good, it has to be good. Yeah, um, you've worked and acted uh, at the Lillian Theater in that mm -hmm. anything. Right. You wrote it. Tell me a little bit about that play. Well, that's with, I'm a member of the Elephant Theater Company. I was just well. going to ask you about that, too. Is that all part of it, like mm, that? There's a connection, because I think because of me, because I'm, I sort of cross-pollinate the two. That's Stella's great. and uh, the Elephant. I love uh, that. Yeah, they're f and the Elephant Theater is a remarkable little place, uh, and they do great work. In fact, I'm in a play right there, there right now, called uh, little, The Little Flower of East Orange. Oh, that's Philip... Um, uh, Stephen uh, Adley Gerges. Steve, Stephen, yeah, Gerges. Yeah, Gerges. Wrote it, yeah, I saw that in New York. And it, Yeah, and it's our first uh, collaboration with The Labyrinth in New York. Oh, A Labyrinth, did, well, because who else was in it? Uh, Gerges is in Labyrinth, isn't right. he? Right, he's, yeah, yeah, he's yeah. one of the directors of The Lab. And uh, so we are now. Oh, that's great. We are now sort of a, a loose partnership with the Labyrinth. Oh, I like that. That's fantastic. I love the Lab. I think they're great. They I always really see their favorite. things in New York. Yeah. Well, so anything was at the Lillian, mm -hmm. and that was a big. Got a lot of awards. And yeah, that did really well. And that uh, that play, they've done three of my plays. They did Los Muertos and Anything, and then Supernova this year. And uh, anything was... Uh, Los Muertos, I saw. Yeah. It was great. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thank now you. it's all coming. Hello, Tim. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's all coming back. But Supernova at the Elephant, too. Yeah, we just did that, and uh, that had a great run as well. Everything that what was the that about? Had. Supernova was about a, a woman uh, sort of trapped in a difficult marriage in Omaha, Nebraska, mm. who through a phone connection begins to find love again with a, a gentleman in Los Angeles. Oh, phone, not the yeah, internet. Yeah, phone. <laughs> it's almost, um, yeah, because she, she doesn't really understand the internet. Oh, so. that's so great. Yeah. Okay, then um, the Imago Fest. Mm -hmm. That's so the, what we're going to talk about, because it's a group of three one acts, right? right? Right, and this is part of the collective as well. Oh, it is? Yeah. Okay, so tell me about it. Here's the poster, Imago Fest. So there's three plays, one I wrote, and a, a great young playwright named Alex Aves. She's uh, really remarkable. And uh, a guy named Joe Benito, who is a, a very respected playwright around town as well. And so we have these three plays that Jack Rogers decided he wanted to put together. Oh. Uh, and so they're, they're th loosely based, uh, loosely connected theme-wise. But you're directing. I'm directing mine. Oh, you're only uh, directing yours. Right. Who's directing? Uh, My wife is directing the other two. Oh, she is? <laughs> yeah. Oh. Did she study also at Adler? She studied at Adler as well. And did she use your name, McNeil? She did. She has. <laughs> so and far. she still is. <laughs> So far. <laughs> and she still is. Well, what is Alex's play about? Alex's play is a beautiful play called Herculaneum, and it's about a, a woman who is uh, going through cancer, and she doesn't have much time left, and it's a, a reunion with her, her, her mother, who is a, an archaeologist. Oh. Herculaneum is actually a true story that 
uh, during Pompeii back in uh, Italy in the BC, uh, when Pompeii erupted, the people in Herculaneum they sealed up their houses because they thought they could escape the. They stayed inside and yeah, sealed them. And they suffocated to death. Oh wow! And that's what the, that's the, the theory metaphor, of being. Yeah. yeah. Oh my gosh. Okay. It's a beautiful play. She she also. It's, I mean, it sounds very um, difficult material, but she's such a a wonderful, expressive writer that it it's really enlightening and beautiful. And Bonitos. Benito's is a, a meditation on the afterlife. Mm, really? Yeah. Which oh, is so really this is really heavy going. It is. It's real. It really is. It's. Um, I mean, they're they're all three of them are comedies. They're but, comedies, but they're heavy going. Yeah, but right? heavy going, definitely. Right. Yeah. And yours? Mine is a, a post-apocalypse play <laughs> with uh, Natalie Portman in it. She's not in the play, but she's one of the characters in it. And it's you a, write about her. In this, I mean, in this she's thing. the person that you're writing about? Right. And she yeah. goes through the... She goes through the apocalypse. It's, <laughs> it's really a... That, my play is really about um, greed and trying to make sense of it. And uh, she's, she's the lead character in it. There's a, a girl named... A woman named Angela Oakenfold, a really talented young actress. I think she's going to do really well. She's, she's playing the role? She's playing Natalie. And you're directing it? I'm directing it, yeah. How do you juggle, like, directing and writing uh, and, and mm. being a part of, like, this company you're talking about and all these different things? I, I think I'm um, one led to the other to the other. So uh, studying with Stella and Joanne Limville, who teaches at, the, uh, uh, st at Stella Adler as well, gave me the desire to write as oh. well as act. Because you've acted a lot. I've acted a lot. I mean, and you're I still acting. I started as an actor. Yeah, so. right. And then um, I still act all the time. Uh, and the writing came from that. And then I was directing all along. And I can't seem to divorce myself from any of it. You know, <laughs> I, I love all of it. So I'm just too busy, really. What kind of roles do you play? Well, when you act? In film and television, <laughs> I'm usually playing homeless people or... <laughs> Mentally challenged people or very, are very very strange people, usually on film and television. In theater, I do. I've played uh, Claudius Polonius. I've played uh, oh, oh. Pazzo and the... Waiting for Godot. Uh, right. I, I've done a couple of Chekhov plays. The I've classics played. you do? Yeah, I do a lot of ch classical work. It tell us a little bit, because we're ready to leave, but Los Muertos. Mm. Tell us about that story, because I thought it was beautiful. Yeah, that, that play really was about um, the nature of guilt and, and how we are responsible to other human beings. And Dave Fofi at The Elephant loved the play, and uh, he wanted me in it. It was my first production at The Elephant, and a couple of uh, my students Came oh, we're in to it too. It. Yeah, and they were really fantastic in it. So, Los Muertos was the kind of play that really was shocking and a little painful for people to sit through. I at could times. see that at the public theater. I think so too. In fact, the lab, the lab took uh, it. It went. It was almost picked for their season a year ago. Oh, it was. See, I could see that because that's they have a great uh, group of Latin actors. Yeah. And they understand that kind of work. Yeah. And I really would have loved to see them do that. Maybe they will in the future. Yeah, now that this is going. Yeah. Well, I'm so glad you came and told it's us so about fantastic. all this. <laughs> thank you so thank much. Thank you, Joan. Tim. I and thank it. you for watching the Joan Quinn Profiles. Keep writing to to 777 South Figueroa, 44th floor, Los Angeles, 90017. But I love your emails. J A Q U I N N 1 at AOL.com. We'll see you next time. <laughs>